So a warm, warm welcome to everybody joining us. Hello there for the second session of day two of our ninth annual uh, D3 meeting. We've always had a separate day for diagnostics. It's always been an unmet need throughout the nine years that we've tracked it, at least uh, in terms of uh, NTDs. We're all fully aware of that. We just had the first session looking at the future of disease elimination. A lot of points uh, raised in that in terms of, um, you know, um, what needs to happen from a financial perspective, uh, from a regulatory harmonization perspective, uh, indeed a tech perspective as well. So a lot of ground was covered in that. Um, we wanted to have a little bit of a touch in terms of novel point of care diagnostics that are happening out there. Um, we've got quite a mixed bag in terms of disease settings. Um, a very interesting session to see some of this tech in action. Um, we just changed slightly the order of um, play. Um, we're very honored to be joined today uh, by Dr. Temiko Bana from the Delft University of Technology uh, and the Inspired Project, talking about digital optical diagnostics for Schisto and the Schistoscope. Joining us from Singapore, from Australia, but it's joining us from Singapore, talking about the G6PD. A diagnostic in terms of the G6PD mutation and screening for that in, in various populations uh, to hopefully improve point of care malaria diagnosis. And then we'll end the session with Elias Cabas Pinango, the PhD candidate from the Lamberton Lab at the University of Glasgow, really looking at the kind of highs and lows on the road to developing an RDT for the non invasive point of care diagnosis for schisto. So I think that's enough from me. There's a lot to unpack in this session. Um, I think we're going to go. Uh, I think the first speaker that we're going to we're going to just change the order slightly. So we we're going to be speaking. Sorry, it's my cat. Uh, with um, Benedict, do, would you like to come come on before? Come on first. Is that okay with you? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So um, thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Benedict Clay. I work at the Menzies School of Health Research in Darwin in Australia. And um, today I will be talking about a novel quantitative G6PD diagnostic, which we evaluated. So outside of Africa, Plasmodium vivax has become the dominant malaria species with approximately two and a half billion people at risk of infection and then estimated annual burden of around four to 14 million cases. It really depends on what source you look at. Um, right, so in contrast to the more prominent Plasmodium falciparum, the Vivex malaria parasite forms dormant liver stages, so-called hypnozoites, that reactivate weeks to months after primary infection and cause up to 80% of all clinical episodes in some region, regions of Asia. Now, hypnozoites are metabolically highly inactive. The group of eight aminoquinolines are the only drugs that effectively remove these dormant liver stages from the human host in the course of radical cure. Primaquin is the most widely used eight aminoquinoline and is given over the course of 14 days in individuals with more than 30% G6PD enzyme activity. And there are a number of qualitative bedside diagnostics that can distinguish patients with less than and more than 30% activity. Now, individuals with less than 30% activity are classified as G6PD deficient, and it's estimated that between four to 500 million people worldwide are actually G6PD deficient. Unfortunately, with highest prevalence of G6PD deficiency found in malaria endemic areas or areas that historically were endemic for malaria. Now, the current standard radical cure treatment over 14 days results in poor treatment adherence and accordingly a very low effectiveness. Over the last years, shorter treatment regimens have been introduced that are likely to increase treatment adherence and effectiveness. However, all of these regimens can only be provided to patients with higher G6PD activities, probably above the 70% threshold. And these higher cutoffs can only be diagnosed by quantitative diagnostics, namely spectrophotometry. Spectrophotometry is fairly complicated to perform cannot provide a result within a couple of minutes and requires a well-equipped laboratory, so it's clearly not suitable for point-of-care diagnosis in remote areas where most, uh, or actually, yeah, where most of the Vivex patients present. In addition, spectrophotometry is poorly standardized, 
And as you can see from this figure, a meta-analysis from 2020 found that when the same controls were measured by spectrophotometry using assays from the same manufacturer, but at different sites, the absolute results in units per gram of hemoglobin would vary significantly. In consequence, no global definition of 100% G6PD activity exists. This has to be re-established for each population and assay separately. And that, of course, is a major setback for the broad rollout of effective radical cure. Now, a couple of years ago, SD Biosensor from South Korea introduced a handheld quantitative G6PD diagnostic that would address these shortcomings. The test requires 10 microliters of um, blood that is added to a lysis buffer and 10 microliters of the blood buffer solution are then added to the machine, which presents G6PD activity in units per gram HP, as well as in a hemoglobin reading in grams per deciliter within two minutes. The device has been evaluated on fresh blood samples in Brazil, the UK and the USA so far against spectrophotometry. And when comparing findings to the reference method spectrophotometry, weighted accuracy across all studies at a 70% cutoff threshold was 95% in venous blood. Now, following on from the 2020 meta-analysis that had reported poor reproducibility of the reference method spectrophotometry, we were then interested to see how much the results from the biosensor would differ when performed repeatedly. In collaboration with FIND, we therefore developed a protocol to assess how much measured G6PD activities would differ if the same sample was tested by the same machine repeatedly and how reproducible, apologies, reproducible results would be when the same sample was tested by different machines. In both cases, we would compare the biosensor results to spectrophotometry using assays from Point Scientific normalized by IHB reading measured by HemoQ. In order to eliminate variation from different blood samples, we used lyophilized control samples that were derived from human blood. We used three types of controls, high, intermediate, and low, and all controls were reconstituted following the manufacturer recommendation, stored at 4 degrees Celsius when not in use, and used within 48 hours. The study consisted of two phases, phase A and phase B. In phase A, 10 devices were tested in parallel by the same experienced laboratory technician who had worked with the biosensor before. Each day, control, um, each, day each control was tested three times by each of the devices, as well as the reference method spectrophotometry, um, and controls per category were from the same lot number. This was repeated over five days, resulting in 200 biosensor results and 20 spectrophotometry results per control. In phase B, each machine, together with a set of high, intermediate, and low controls, was shipped to a different laboratory with temperature-controlled spectrophotometry. And while the same testing procedures were applied, the testing duration was extended to 10 days, resulting in 1,200 biosensor results and 1,200 paired spectrophotometry results. Selected sites had experience in doing spectrophotometry. Six out of the 10 sites had also used the biosensor previously. Testing was done by a single technician who received a standardized online training of approximately one hour on how to use the biosensor. Lot numbers of controls did not differ within phases. However, lot numbers of deficient controls differed between phase A and phase B. In phase A, we assessed repeatability. Now, this box and whiskers plot shows the results of all 10 machines stratified per low, intermediate, and high control. Blue red and green shaded areas indicate the recommended range suggested by the controls manufacturer, ACS. Circled results reflect the readings of the reference method. The dotted horizontal lines indicate the median reading across all machines, excluding the reference method per control. Median G6PD readings across all machines did not differ significantly per control category, but were below the recommended range provided by the manufacturer. And this applied to both results from the biosensors as well as the reference method spectrophotometry. Low and intermediate readings specifically for the biosensor were quite close together, with six intermediate results overlapping with 122 low results. Now, when calculating the coefficient of variation to determine repeatability, the mean coefficient of variation ranged from 0.11 to 0.26 for the biosensor and was lower for spectrophotometry, ranging from 0. 
0.12 to 0.17. The study then proceeded to phase B. Each machine, together with a set of standardized controls, was sent out to a separate, a separate laboratory, four in the US, one in Brazil, one in France, and four in Asia, highlighted in dark orange on this map. Now, when comparing G6PD activities across the different sites, using a mixed effects model, results from the biosensor did not differ significantly while absolute readings by spectrophotometry showed a significant dif difference. Repeatability across all 10 sites for the biosensor was very much alike, while precision for spectrophotometry differed in between sites, with some sites generating results with very small variation and others with much greater variation. Across all 10 sites, intermediate biosensor readings were 0.3 units per gram HP below the low controls, and that was a significant difference. This was not seen for spectrophotometry, where readings for low, intermediate, and high controls were clearly set apart across all sites, however, not necessarily between sites. The pooled correlation between biosensor and spectrophotometry was positive and significant. Given the significant variation in spectrophotometry observed across sites, we calculated the median instead of the mean difference for all machines combined, and this median difference was 0.25 units per gram HP with the biosensor generating lower readings. However, the difference is overall ranged from minus 2.6 units per gram HP to plus 1.1 unit per gram HP. Since lot numbers for high and intermediate controls did not differ between phases, we were able to compare the impact different users would have on the same machine for these controls. Repeatability between both phases did not differ significantly, while mean G6PD activities differed significantly for intermediate and high controls. The pooled difference for intermediate controls was 0.2 units per gram HP and 0.4 units per gram HP for high controls. Now, four out of the 10 technicians had not used the device before and were able to perform measurements after a one hour online training. The biosensor showed good and consistent repeatability across all devices in both phases. In contrast, repeatability of spectrophotometry was superior, superior to the biosensor at some sites, but not others. We found reproducibility of the biosensor to be good. Measured G6PD activity showed no significant difference when the same control was tested by the same user on different machines. When the same control was measured on different machines and measured by different users, and when the same machine was operated by different users, the absolute difference was less than 0.5 units per gram HB. Measured G6PD activities by biosense and spectrophotometry correlated well and were higher in phase A, not least in spectrophotometry readings in phase B showed greater variation. However, while spectrophotometry could reliably discriminate between the three contro control categories in phase A and B, the biosensor results less clearly distinguished low from intermediate samples. Specifically in phase B, the biosensor did not distinguish between low and intermediate controls. In fact, the results were significantly lower for intermediate compared to low controls, and this was consistent across all sites. Since spectrophotometry in phase B distinguished between all three control categories, the observed overlap for the biosensor is unlikely to be due to, uh, to damaged controls. Now, this study has several limitations. For one, our total sample size was three controls, and this does not allow to calculate accuracy of the biosensor. Biosensor and spectrophotometry are designed for fresh blood. In contrast, we used lyophilized samples, and this may have affected the accuracy of the results with differing effects for biosensor and spectrophotometry. We found G6PD control readings by spectrophotometry and biosensor to be below the recommended range. Unfortunately, the manufacturer was not able to provide further controls from the same lot, so we could not look at this in greater detail. In consequence, low and intermediate G6PD readings were very close together in both phases. Lot numbers for low controls differed between phase A and B, and this could explain the massive overlap we saw between low and intermediate control readings in phase B, but not to the same extent in phase A. G6PD activity measured by spectrophotometry must be normalized by a hemoglobin reading. In phase A, HB readings from a hemoq 301 were considered. However, in phase B, the reference method for HB readings differed by site. 
While most sites use the three or one model, some sites use different models, and this will have contributed to the observed variability in, spec in measurements. And finally, testing was done in a highly controlled environment by very qualified technicians who had several years of a laboratory experience. The measurement procedure involves two critical pipetting steps, and these may introduce variation when the device is used in routine practice. Um, summarizing the observed reproducibility suggests that the biosensor may be a suitable point of care diagnostic to identify individuals above and below predefined universally applicable cutoff activities if these findings can be confirmed in real world settings and if the same studies also confirm the previous report the discriminatory power of the biosensor also at low activities that we did not see. The next steps will therefore be to confirm these findings in real world settings and establish the effective performance, reproducibility and repeatability of the biosensor in real life settings. And finally, identify training needs and develop standardized training materials for the biosensor. Thank you very much. And this brings me to the last slide. The pro this project was funded through a grant of the Australian government provided to find and has been a group effort to, of all 10 collaborators who provided labor, lab space inspector photometers for free. Thank you very much again for your attention. Benedict, thank you very, very much for that wonderful presentation. And we know how important it is in terms of G6PD mutation screening. There are hardly any assays, if, if, if any at all, out there that are, that are functional. I think that's going to cause a, have a lot of interest. I think some of the questions that will pop up in the Q&A will be about next steps and what are your plans for, for further adoption and how you're going to go about achieving that. So I do think, you know, thank you very, very much for that. And again, thanks for joining us from Singapore. I know the time difference is we were there a week and a half ago. So thanks, double thanks for, for that. Um, so that that was the first uh, speaker. I think we're going to move to the second speaker now, Dr. Temitope Agbana. Uh, from the uh, postdoc at the Delft University of Technology, um, to Delft, and the Inspired Project. Um, Temitope, are you okay if we, we put you in for the for this slot now? Are you okay? Absolutely. Thank Can you, you hear me? Okay, good. That's good. Really perfectly. Thank you for that. So we're going to look at digital optical diagnostics, <coughs> schistosomosis, and the schistoscope, a project that, that uh, Dr. Agman has been involved in. Um, I'm going to hand this, the floor over to you. There we go. And we can see your slides. I'm gonna, just going to back out. Over yeah. to you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, good good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Good day. Uh, in summary, uh, my name is Dimitri Pagbano, like you've heard, and I'm Systems and Controls postdoc on the Inspired Project. And I would like to share some updates, uh, some progress report on the development of uh, uh, Chistoscope 5.0, and I'll tell you why we call it 5.0 uh, very quickly. And this is an inspired pro program or project, um, a collaboration of the different organizations from DEV to L LUMC, the Leiden University Medical Center to SEML across different countries to Nigeria. Uh, and we are quite very happy. Uh, so what is the inspired uh, project? Just to give a very quick, brief introduction, uh, the inspired project is actually an uh, acronym for inclusive diagnostics for poverty related parasitic diseases and is a research project uh, for development and validation of inclusive smart easy to use cost effective and efficient optical devices for the diagnosis of poverty related parasitic diseases in this discussion i'll be talking basically of i'll be more focused on the chistoscope uh, a device that is actually developed, customized, and dedicated system to combat or face the challenge of diagnosis in the area of chistosomiasis. And we actually looking at uh, 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 combining very interesting optical systems uh, with artificial intelligence uh, to realize a digital microscope, optical microscope that we can use, take to the feed, point of care like, and can also complement the gaps that are already existing in the diagnosis of chistosomiasis. And I think I don't need to go to the details because this is a very professional platform. Uh, and also, if you really want to know a lot more about AI-driven pathology, I will challenge I think we've just lost your sound there, Temitope. 
Tim, can you hear me? Yeah, we've just... Oh, can you hear me? There, 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 there you're back, you're back. Oh, sorry. Something went wrong, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Quite funny. But anyhow, uh, uh, if you want to know more about this digital AI-driven digital pathology, I really enjoyed the presentation of uh, Dr. Levin Stilver last year on the same platform on uh, partnering to leverage artificial intelligence-driven digital pathology to strengthen soil transmitted element. It gives an overview, very good overview on what uh, uh, the AI and the optics and all of this combination and what we set out to achieve practically similar while they are more focused on the mansonine part, we've done quite some work on the chistosomiasis hematobium, urinary chistosomiasis. And we've looked at uh, R&D, we've done research and, and development in three dimensions, looking at number one, the imaging platform, we look at the automation, the AI, data-driven algorithm, data preprocessing, and then we looked at the context, you know, local manufacturing, which is quite very, very important. And I will show later in the presentation why this is also very, very important. Uh, from the imaging perspective, we've looked at series, we looked at lens-based method, we looked at less lens imaging systems, such as holography, digital holography. And then finally, we came to one basic conclusion that, well, we, we would rather stay with the lens-based method, which is uh, it's a simple microscope. And we've gone through different iterations. We've done chistoscope in four generations. We started by actually looking at developing a point of care device that we can uh, you we can realize or implement with just very basic smartphones, uh, very small system, uh, take to the field. And that was the first generation. And it was quite very interesting, got some very media, good media attention. But we soon realized that this is not very practical. There were a lot of challenges and uh, complications and complexities attached to it uh, from the up from the optimization of the optical train, which is already predefined in the smartphone, to other complexities. Then we went on to develop the Raspberry the Raspberry Pi based method, where we customize the optics, we use the Raspberry Pi as our uh, processor, and then we realize some very beautiful, nice, also good uh, uh, system that could actually detect. Uh, urinary chistosomiasis eggs in urine. And then we went on further to even develop some two of these products and send them to Gabon to be tested by our colleagues in the CML in Gabon. And the results were good, but also again, we're not very satisfied with the robustness, with the reliability, and, uh, and, and, and some of the results we got. So we went on to the fourth generation, which is actually uh, what you see there, which was shipped to Nigeria in November 2020. Uh, but eventually, with the feedback we got from that project, then we moved away from the smartphone-based method, we moved away from the Raspberry Pi uh, customized optics-based method, and then we decided to develop, you know, just very standard optical system based on the standard microscope, and then try to see how we can optimize. And the main design drivers in this in this was number one the robustness how robust uh, reliable can the system be particularly on the field considering the context we are looking at i mean most of these devices they deliver excellent performances in the laboratory but it's another thing completely to take them to the field you get high sensitivity specificity with cultured samples but when you get to the field that is another challenge so we started looking more practically on how do we uh, uh, increase the robustness, the reliability. The number two was cost and local production. We want the people to own it. We want we want we want it to be locally produced, technically maintained at the local level. So how how can we realize that? How do we develop a system that can actually actualize this? Simple to maintain, affordable, and easily deployable, yet reliable. You know. And then we also look at usability and adoption. While it's part of the team, we had we had is a consortium of of different uh, expertise. The team was looking at the controls, looking at the optics, looking at automation. Another team was looking at stakeholder analysis, parasitology perspective from different organizations and different uh, universities and research institutions. And we wanted to see what uh, what do the people really want? What can they cope with? What can they use? What is practical for them on the field? And then finally, handling and hygiene. Some of the limitations we had with the smartphone-based methods where we were, were also based on handling. It was difficult practically to handle these devices for multiple uh, uh, or many samples per day. And then how do we deal with the hygiene? How do we deal with some of these complexities? Uh, then 
we came to Chisto School 5.0. It's been a lot of co-creation. We go to the field, we get input at every level. Uh, from the smartphone base, we went to the field, we got some input, and we said, no, we need to optimize. We went back again, came back, went to Gabon, we came back, and finally, we I think we are converging to something quite very interesting and quite practical on the field. And then we call it the Chisto School 5.0. And then we just take very uh, standard optical system for X magnification objective, you know, and then, of course, uh, try to customize the optical train the way we want to do it, automate all the sample arm movement, autofocus the system. Uh, just like I said again, uh, Dr. Levin described this whole uh, uh, package in his presentation on this ISM. And so you could go back or check and you get more details on that. But then we came up with this beautiful system and you can see some of the images uh, which, which could deliver a resolution of 3.26 micrometers. That was quite very good. Of course, it will resolve very efficiently the uh, Chistosoma hematobion that we're looking at, even Mansona, even some of the STH, because typically we looked at the optical characteristics of some of these eggs in stool samples, in urine samples, and of course, this resolution is super good and sufficient uh, to resolve the target. Um, then also we look at sample analysis timing for 13 millimeter filter that we did on the field. I'll show you some of the results of our field work and we could scan at least first test on the field with Chistoscope 5.0 was done last year, went to Nigeria and then we could scan and do all of this sample analysis in 17 minutes, 15 minutes to register all the images we need, about 113 images and of course five minutes to do the processing uh, on, on, this, on the attached system. And then you can see uh, A is the optical, schematic optical train, uh, B is the autofocus Z axis, uh, C is the X and Y sample arm movement, uh, and then of course the D is the integrated chistoscope, which uh, looks quite big at the moment, of course, I will comment a bit more on that later. And then of course we have the integrated Raspberry Pi 4B, and of course the sensor, camera sensors attached to it. Now, at the moment, the target cost of prototyping this is still, uh, well, a, a bit expensive, but we are looking at really bringing it down to less than even 500 or about 700 at some point. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we've tested this with hematobium. The beautiful thing about the algorithm we developed specifically for this system is that uh, it has the capacity to also deal with cluster samples. So one of the challenges we see practically on the field is that you have this cluster sample like you can see on your right. And then of course, your estimation or parasitemia estimation becomes challenging when you have these uh, eggs that stick together. Then we've been working on developing algorithms that could actually segment these eggs quite efficiently and give us some good uh, uh, estimate of what the eggs, uh, number of eggs we have in a field of view. Are we there yet? Absolutely not, but at least we got some very positive results. Now we took the device to the field in 2021. This is Nigeria, and you can already see that, number one, at least we have some interesting thing that you see two of these microscopies, all the complicated complexities and the challenges and the trouble associated associated with microscopy. You could see the why we have an engineer, one of our engineer PhD candidates, Prosper, uh, who was just running the same test, just by the side, a bit more relaxed and with less complexity. Now in Nigeria, we had four eighty-eight samples, and the goal was to compare uh, the performance of the chistoscope with a reference standard, in this case, microscopy. You know, so we analyzed 487, one sample was excluded, so we have 487 samples. And then we had two methods. Number one was to do a complete, fully integrated uh, system where you have all the control softwares and you have also, you have the uh, artificial intelligence all running as a package. Uh, and then also compare that performance to semi fully automated where you have uh, just the control systems, register all the images, into a particular folder, and then maybe an expert or somebody trained could come and look at all those images and tell which of them is positive or where you have eggs or not and count them. So that means one method that we looked at had the AI doing the analysis and the other method had a human uh, expert just looking at all the registered images and then uh, making the conclusion. And we got this performance metrics. Uh, the sensitivity we got what was 87.3% for the fully automated and 90.3% uh, for the semi-automated. Uh, specificity, 
was 48.9. The previous uh, presentation was quite interesting. I'm, I joined in a bit late, but uh, it was quite interesting when uh, the previous speaker, some, some speaker in the previous session said specificity could be very, very uh, important. So I printed out the paper, I will read it afterwards. And then specificity here uh, for the same automated is 95.3, uh, positive predictive value uh, 46.9 for the fully automated and 89.8 for semi automated. And then, of course, negative predictive value also uh gives us 88.2 for the fully automated and 90.3 for the semi-automated now this the detail of the qualitative analysis of the results of this study have been submitted for review so i'm sure very soon we have some results and some inputs uh some 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 more details to share with you uh but some lessons learned very practically from the field uh, number one for us is the co-creation part you know uh, it's very important to get practical inputs from the local context. We were very excited with the things we started from Tistoscope 1.0, where we use smartphones, where we use uh, very nice, cool uh, technology, and we got a lot of media attention. We got some very nice results with cultured samples. But when we got to the field, we discovered that it was completely different. Local context, how do you maintain? How do you clean? How do you do uh, uh, scanning, X and Y scanning, with such very limited uh, focal range between your your objective and uh, your sample. It was practically impossible. So, oh well, for, for real field work, for point of care, for, for lab, great. But for lab uh, field work, where you have dust, where you have humidity, where you have temperature variation, where you have all manner of environmental factors, uh, you have ruggedity, you have, you have bumpy roads and all manner of stuff like that, that could be a challenge. So when we went to the field and we came back, we discovered that a lot of input from the people, from the local context, talking to them, what do you want, how? And then we came back to iterate. The second point, I go back and forth. Go check, come back, iterate. Uh, that's actually the pipeline of our progress so far. We came back, we used the feedback and the results to uh, optimize our design models, our algorithms, and then uh, use feed samples, you know, Culture samples were used at the beginning and they are still being used to calibrate at some point. But we find out that when you go to the field, you are exposed to some kind of interesting things. Now, why do we have some variation? Uh, well, to us, we are not really satisfied with the specificity, although, well, we are happy with the sensitivity. But we think that uh, some of the challenges are also based on uh, uh, crystals. You have urine crystals, false positives. You had a lot of false positives uh, detected by our systems, uh, fully automated system AI, because of the crystals. Some of these crystals, you don't see them on the field. Uh, sorry, in the culture samples, we, we never saw them actually. But on the field, we using practical samples. We see, and then we see the issue of co infection. We're so shocked. Well, I'm an engineer, but we're very, very surprised and shocked to see. Uh, you can see the first image up there to see uh, a mansonai in a urine filtered sample. How did it get there? We have different school of thought. I'm not a parasitologist and I don't have the permanent answer to this, but there are different school of thought. But these are things that you will see on the field. And then uh, the final point that we learned and very interesting for us is align with TPP and test. So from the beginning, we start aligning and doing all that, that, that we can do uh, with the TPP. But what are the challenges? I, the TPP is the target product profile from WHO, and it gives you very clear you know, view of what is expected, what is expected, you know, what is expected. Um, now, based on that, we want to optimize, looking forward. We want to improve our AI performance, uh, increase sensitivity, specificity, uh, optimize the control software, this optimize the user interface, optimize our optical configuration, uh, to get the best of resolution and improve sample processing time. Uh, for the design research, we want to also uh, optimize the system portability, make it small, make it a backpack. People can carry it. We have design teams working on the possibilities of realizing very simple portable system that we can take to the field. We, we, and we know we can do it. Uh, then we have integration of monitors into the system uh, so that we have an integrated complete system. That's a requirement from the field. Uh, then, of course, improve on robustness and reliability and also have integrated power supply from the TPP also at least have some battery backup integrated into the system and and run it. And then alignment, look at the cost, look at the performance metrics, look at the ease of use. Uh, so far, so good, uh, like the previous speaker as well. 
in one hour, we've seen that in one hour, you can easily get people trained at the lowest level and yet they can run the device very effectively and then ensure fit compatibility with relevance to DOS, to, to, to whatever it is, uh, increase that potential. Yes, so that is the conclusion of my presentation. Just give you a quick update on our Chistoscope and the journey so far. Uh, and then here is the acknowledgement. We have a large consortium sponsored by uh, different groups, NWO, TU Deft, uh, uh, CML, uh, Lighting University Medical Centrum, University of Lagos, University of Ibadan. Uh, and you can find more information on our website. Thank you very much. Uh, and you could ask questions if you have some. Thank you very, very much, Temitate, for that wonderful presentation. Um, it's a lot of questions are coming through, actually, and we're going to kind of weave those into the Q&A at the end. But a fantastic um, uh, presentation and the journey uh, on, in terms of uh, where you've come from. And really interesting how you're involving the co-creation, you know, that kind of uh, giving that platform to the local um, kind of voice and the local inputs into your design um, and, and kind of future movement of the schistoscope. Well, that's fantastic. Um, brilliant. And we really appreciate that. Some really good, um, so Dr. Alexander Edwards, who's one of the speakers, having played with homemade digital microscopes, I'm really impressed by this system. Beautiful images. I want to build one. <laughs> Imagine somebody there. Um, so that, that's great. Le Dr. Levin Stiver from Johnson & Johnson. Very nice and impressive progress. Thanks for this presentation. A lot of really good uh, feedback for both presenters and a lot of uh, and a lot of some very good questions coming through um, from the wonderful audience. And so on that basis, I'll just give a quick shout out to some of the people that are joining us today. So obviously the speakers, but then people like uh, Dr. Oliver Higgins from the University of Glasgow. Great talks so far. Um, uh, Dr. Insaf Bel Haji Ali from the Institute Pasteur in Tunisia. He very kindly joined us in the first session and this one. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim Raibu from the Female Genital Schister Society of Nigeria. Um, interesting uh, addition to the, to the audience there. Um, and then we've got other people as well. Um, so from Ethiopia, Tekelau Waldkiros from Hawassa University, and also um, just joined us uh, and, and a question from June Mercer Chalmers from the University of Bath. Very interesting talks, and there's some other questions which we'll come to at the end of the Q&A. You mentioned um, you, you'd seen the AI uh, presentation with Lee Van Stoven on this platform uh, before, uh, and, and we're definitely trying to push that. Um, in terms of the AI capabilities. We had Darlington Agogo from the uh, from Ghana, the Mino Labs, um, give a really interesting presentation on AI um, generated within Ghana, uh, the lab that he's in charge of there. So some fantastic movement forward. And I do, it's very exciting to see this project and how it could probably converge and how it would develop. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, that's enough for me for, for that. I think we'll move to the second, uh, the third speaker now. And we've managed to get Dr. Alexander Edwards, Associate Professor at Reading School of Pharmacy, uh, University of Reading, back. There was some issue probably on our side, I'm not sure, in terms of the connectivity, but he's back. So great stuff. We're going to be talking about the Cygnus Smartphone Multiplex Microcapillary Diagnostics, a rapid serotype-specific NS1 detection of dengue. It's a topic very close to our hearts. We spearhead the uh, World Dengue Day campaign. We're actually out in Singapore a week and a half ago for the Asia Dengue Summit. We were on the co-conveners with ADVA, Asian Dengue Voice in Action, uh, or the ASEAN Secretariat. We had various ministers from Singapore attending. Um, so NS1 was a, obviously a huge issue. The serotype of the patients is a massive issue um, and something that needs to be kind of covered. So we're very happy to give the floor over to you, Al. It's enough for me and I'm going to back out. Al, over to you. First of all, just by way of introduction with this audience, I think it's very important to sort of declare my um, focus. So I'm mainly going to be talking about the technology development um, and we're going to be using technology and developing technology to tackle this incredibly important virus, dengue virus. Um, I'm sure you all are aware of the importance of that. Um, I don't need to explain it to this audience. My uh, 
collaborators and co-developers of this research um, are, are incredibly important to this research and they're the guys that are really focused on tackling the virus. My input really is just as a, you know, if you like an engineer building some bits of kit. Um, so over in Bangkok in the Siraj Hospital, there's the Dengue Hemorrhagic Fever Research Unit. It's been established for a really long time and I just want to say how grateful I am that they work with me and they developed uh, assays and antibodies for detection of um, dengue virus NS1. Um, and as I say, I'm just the, the, the guy doing the measurement tools. So I want to tell you a little bit about the measurement tools that we've been developing. Um, and But I don't want to uh, ignore their contribution. So I just wanted to say we've just got this um, a lot of this work published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. And it's really this team here that I want to thank. Um, a range of different people, not just in the Siraj Hospital, in the Madihol University and the biotech, uh, the Thai government supports this research and does a fantastic job. Um, and following from that, really, I'm going to try and excuse myself from the most important problem, which is, um, you know, in this context, in the context of this audience, I think the most important thing is how do we address unmet medical need or unmet, unmet cl clinical need? And in the case of dengue, the, the reason, one of the reasons it's such a big problem is because it is a complex problem to solve. Um, and developing technology alone isn't gonna solve that problem. We have to work together. So what I can do though is say, um, at the beginning is that the big question to me is actually how do we use the technology to solve the clinical needs um, and I'm just going to put a couple of examples of the kinds of use cases that might be uh, valuable um, for um, dengue but I don't really want to spend time on it now so let's go through some of these these possible questions the obvious one when you're looking at an infection is is the patient infected with the with the pathogen? And with dengue, there are always problems of cross reactivity and overlap with different flavor viruses, um, and even some non flavor virus infections which present similarly. So the first question might be, you know, what is the infection? Um, but moving on from that, with dengue, we have this particular problem that there are four different serotypes. Um, so maybe it's it's important sometimes to know which serotype you have. Um, again, with dengue, a really, really critical factor is, is the infection, a primary infection or a secondary infection, uh, because we know that people um, are much more likely to get severe disease when they have a second infection. But even then, I don't think it's the biggest question. The biggest question of all, I think, clinically, is when somebody has confirmed to have a dengue infection is to know, are they going to develop severe disease? Are they going to suddenly um, develop this, you know, really, really life-threatening hemorrhagic fever, which happens very, very quickly, because if they are going to do that, you need to give them urgent hospital treatment. And if they aren't, and they don't need hospital treatment, it's a waste of precious healthcare resources to hospitalize somebody who doesn't need to be hospitalized. So unfortunately, I can't solve that problem, but I can develop technology that might help to solve that problem in the future. Um, so, um, Really, this talk is not about the most important thing. The talk is about if we had cheap and quantitative multiplex immunoassay technology, which I would argue we are developing now. Um, and so let's think about the technology needs. And this, again, has been a, a, a need for a really long time. Um, you can summarize existing technologies really in, in two ways. You can think about uh, the performance of the technology and you can think about how easy it is to access. Um, and the traditional paradigm is you have high analytical sensitivity, high performance laboratory instruments, things like microplate ELISA. Um, and at the same time, you can also have point of care testing. And we're very familiar with um, the fantastic lateral flow technology, which is really you know, changed a lot of clinical diagnostics across the world. Um, we finally cottoned on to it in the UK and suddenly decided that it was a useful thing even in the UK um, with the COVID um, pandemic. Um, so what's great about lateral flow is that it's quick, it's near patient, it gives you a result immediately. It's very, very low um, cost and can be mass produced in many, many factories across the world. The one real caveat is that it gives you reduced analytical performance compared to a, a lab assay such as a microplate ELISA or a, you know, a lab in immunoassay platform. Um, of course, you would expect that I'm pushing this up upper corner here. This is where we're really targeting. We've got a particular way of doing that, which uses microfluidics, but it's a particular type of microfluidics. And I just want to talk you through the technological development that we've been doing. Um, so the type of microfluidics that we're using um, is based around a slightly different type of 
microfluidics. Um, if you're familiar with the research field, um, you've probably been aware that lab on a chip has been a, a, a dream for many, many, probably 10, 15, maybe longer years. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that the analytical potential of microfluidics has been proven. The gap remains translating this into products. Um, the, the type of microfluidic system we're using is a little bit different in the sense that it is a mass produced material. It's characterized by a pl plastic ribbon, um, which is four millimeters ish wide. It's got 10 capillaries in it. Each of them is about 0.2 millimeters in diameter. So, um, the question is what's special about our kind of microfluidic system and the really special thing to me is that it is genuinely mass produced. So it's a genuinely low cost raw material, a little bit like the nitrocellulose that goes into lateral flow tests, except it's micro channels rather than a, a porous paper matrix. So uh, this is just a picture from our lab where we have reels and reels of this stuff. Each of these reels carries 500 meters of material um, and is you know hundreds of thousands of tests. Um, so the really key thing to me is that the material is mass produced. It's produced by melt extrusion. So of course, how do you use this to do um, an analytical test? Uh, the basic principle is that the manufacturing is the difficult bit, a bit, a bit like a, a factory that produces lateral flow tests. We bulk produce um, uh, the material and then we bulk coat it with, for example, a capture antibody. In the case of the dengue story, we coat different capillaries with antibodies that capture NS1 from different serotypes. And all the user has to do at the end is to um, test their sample in all 10 of these capillaries. Um, and then all the work is done for the, them by the device. So you get 10 independent measurements of your sample um, and you get a, a colorimetric or fluorescent readout. You can take a picture of the strip um, to measure um, the results. Um, and what we primarily use this for in the context of dengue is to do um, enzyme immunoassays. And we're big fans of enzyme immunoassays. Um, and again, you're probably familiar with how this works, but the basic principle is quite simple. We coat the inside of the capillary with a capture antibody, which can detect, which can selectively bind very low concentrations of a target analyte. Um, the target analytes the little star, which is bound even at low concentrations, and it, it's pulled out from a complex matrix such as blood. Nothing else should stick. Um, you then come in and detect even tiny numbers, maybe a few thousands of molecules of your target can be detected using antibodies which bind to that small amount of target. The crucial thing is the antibody has an enzyme molecule in it, and that enzyme is the key to everything because it gives you massive amplification. And even if you only have a few thousand enzyme molecules, you will get a strong yellow or green fluorescent color. Um, and it's that amplification that's critical. So um, the great benefit um, of enzyme amplification is also its limitation, as with many analytical problems, you get this incredible analytical sensitivity. Um, however, your analytical performance is only ever as good as your washing step. Because you can detect a few molecules, you need to wash away all the irrelevant molecules. And as a result of that, you end up with this classic thing. Anybody who's ever done a microplate ELISA will be very familiar, where you have to put sample in, then wash, then detection antibody, then wash, and then you have to wash again, and then you have to add your substrate. And your assay sensitivity is very much limited by the worst washing step, which is something that people don't always uh, focus on. So um, we know that enzyme immunoassays are powerful because they remain incredibly uh, dominant in the area of immunoassay measurements, just looking at publications, which is a very crude measure of importance, but nevertheless, we do that. Going back to um, different methods of doing immunoassay, the enzyme immunoassay remains the most widely published form. There's a really interesting side story there, which is that since the lateral flow patterns expired, the number of publications in lateral flow has grown relentlessly. And I think that's, you know, there's a separate conversation there about IP and um, market domination by um, um, patents. But the crucial thing about enzyme immunoassays is they're, hundreds of, they're easily 100 times more sensitive than lateral flow tests. Um, so we've got our system here. We've got these transparent test tubes. They're very small. They're mass produced. Uh, the advantage of the system is it's very, very simple. Unfortunately, that's also the disadvantage, which is that it is not trivial to do this serial um, sample plus wash plus detection antibody plus um, um, all the other steps without suddenly making this a much more expensive and difficult system. So the disadvantage is that it's simple. 
Um, so we went through a number of iterations of this, and I'll show you a couple of examples. I'll just skim past them. But the big challenge really was we, we know we can do immunoassays in this material, just as we can do immunoassays in a microtiter plate. But how do we simplify the delivery of the fluids so that it doesn't make it so expensive that it's not really practical? Um, so the first thing we did was to use syringes, which is great. One mil syringes, super cheap, super um, disposable, but they're not really that cheap. And also connecting the syringes to the strips isn't that straightforward. So we had this really nice sort of lab in a briefcase concept, which, which validated that we could do immunoassays. The idea here is we simply suck the liquids through the strips. The test strips um, are the little blue uh, lines at the bottom here. Um, great idea, not very practical to sc scale up. We also developed an automated system which used uh, pumps and robots and motors to dry, draw the liquids through. And to be honest, although this was interesting commercially, um, the big disadvantage is you've built a really expensive instrument around your tiny disposable uh, device. My favorite expression for this is instead of lab on a chip, you end up with chip in a lab, i.e. you have this beautiful little miniaturized assay, but it's got a complex infrastructure around it, and so it no longer is cheap and disposable. Um, my favorite method was the simplest of all, which is to simply put a little funnel on the top of the strip, which is what I'm illustrating here, and the funnel at the top, all you need to do is put your liquid in and it will drip through by gravity. This is what I call the lab on a drip, and it's absolutely brilliant. It does work, except there's one problem, which is the washing step. So we, we could prove that it worked and gave us beautiful, really phenomenal analytical sensitivity with this caveat that we had to cheat slightly. So if I show you a, a zoomed in picture of this, we've got the capillary film at the bottom um, and we've got this funnel at the top. And what we find is when we flow liquid through these capillaries, because they're long, thin tubes, you get exquisite washing, much better than a microplate. You don't need very much volume to get perfect washing. Unfortunately, the funnel at the top has really bad washing. And the only ways that we could get the assays to work would be to either take off the funnel and throw it away every time, which is not practical, or to put very large volumes of wash in and then kind of suck out wash buffers, which is again, not very practical and it is definitely no better than a microplate. So eventually we came up with an inspiration, um, which is this curved design, which looks a little bit like a swan. And the idea is it's a bit like a swan sipping um, from a liquid source. Um, that's where the name Cygnus comes from, and that's why swans uh, are relevant. Um, it's a bit of a stretch, but essentially what we're using is we're using the power of gravity to deliver our liquids sequentially through um, the device. So we have the top end of the um, capillaries, and one great thing is our material is flexible, so we can bend it over dead easy. So we end up with a plastic in the middle as a plastic um, cartridge, which contains the waste reservoir at the bottom and a little handle, but it's a little tiny piece of plastic. So it's got no involvement in the fluidics. All it's doing is holding the strip of disposable film that we've already agreed is mass produced. And by dipping the top end of that into a liquid, we immediately get gravity driven flow. Um, and what that allows us to do is with a very, very simple user protocol, all the user has to do is to move the sample, put it against the well, which has the reagent, which is, could be the sample, the reagent or the wash, um, and it will flow. And I just want to try and hopefully show a video. Maybe somebody can confirm that the video is flowing. I think it is. Um, what you should see, that's great, thank you. Um, not much has happened yet. Oh, yes, it is now happening. So what you should have seen there is the little tiny capillaries filled with red dye to simulate blood. We've now put it into a wash step and the blood is washed through very efficiently. And now what we're gonna see is a reagent going in. So you've got to imagine this blue dye is your detection antibody. What you can see is the fluid replacement. And, and as I say, there's no pumps. Um, no complex devices or any other playing around. It's literally the power of gravity taking the reagent from a strip at the top through to a waste chamber at the bottom. And so it's incredibly easy to operate because you just literally move it along one step after another. Um, it's still not quite as simple to use as a lateral flow test, but it's certainly a lot easier to use than um, a traditional microtiter plate immunoassay. So, um, so you can see this 
concept. Uh, we published this um, in a sort of microfluidicsy journal. Um, you can see this sort of illustration of how we get this flow. And we've done a lot of work on the engineering of that to show that, yes, indeed, we get very efficient wish washing and we get very simple fluid delivery. But perhaps the most important um, question is, does it work with real patient samples? What everybody always wants to know is, you, great, you've got a new technology, does it work? And the target that we picked right from the beginning with our fantastic team in Thailand who've been working on dengue for a really long time, about probably 10, 12 years ago, they developed a serotype specific dengue diagnostic based on a microplate ELISA where they have panels of antibodies that bind to different serotypes of NS1. Um, so because NS1 is an abundant protein in plasma during acute dengue infection, it's a relatively useful diagnostic tool. The problem with most um, and it's one based diagnostics is they can't tell you which the serotype is. So you end up having to do PCR or doing virus detection. And um, so we focused on that here and we've got our 10 capillaries. And of course, four serotypes of uh, dengue works beautifully with 10 capillaries. We have dengue one with a pair of capillaries, dengue two, dengue three, dengue four. And we're using capture antibodies, which are selective for this serotype of the NS1. And what we do is we put it the sample through and then we detect with the pan NS1 um, all serotypes detection antibody. Um, and you can see here these little yellow lines correspond to um, the fluorescent signal that we see with the smartphone. It's very easy to take a picture of this material. Um, and so we get very nice quantitation of NS1 um, using a smartphone or whatever camera you like. Um, and crucially, in a way, this is the, the, the proof of the pudding is with 250 patient samples, 50 each of the four different serotypes is that with all except the dengue one serotype, we have a really nice assay, which works, works basically identically to a microplate ELISA and slightly better than a lateral flow test. The one catch with this data is you immediately notice is the specificity for dengue one is not great. And that's simply because the antibody we used against NS1 has some cross reactivity. Um, but it's not a problem with the technology. So I so I say that our technology works even if that antibody doesn't work. And that's the next step is to replace that antibody with a superior antibody. Um, and just like any other diagnostic, you know, it, it's, it's, you're only as good as your um, least effective reagent. So in summary, I would argue we've got this very cost effective, genuinely mass producible microfluidic system. By using this specific design, we've able to simplify the fluid delivery, which is a really critical step. And it, it, it really took us much longer to solve that step than to show that the immunoassay system works. Um, I'm very, very excited to be able to confirm that it works with real samples, exactly like a microplate, Eliza. Um, and um, you know, of course, we want to thank uh, funders and all the team who've worked. But I'm also going to give a little plug because the technology we're using is also very suitable for lots of other things, including um, analytical microbiology. So we can also do analytical microbiology in the same things, but I'm not talking about that now. So I'll go back to my last slide about um, this Cigna system. And with that, I'd like to wrap up and say thank you all for listening. Thank you very, very much. Alexander for that fantastic presentation so much to unpack from that superb uh, I'm sure a lot of questions are going to be coming through from the audience on that um, and don't be shy audience please do you know give a hello your name country if you're probably sick and tired of me saying this but it's a, a very nice way to know who's there and kind of you know a bit more immersive uh, for the panelists as well uh, fantastic um, and I do wonder how this system, you mentioned multiplexing, um, I wonder how this would sit inside uh, the new kind of centers for arboviral preparedness and resilience that, that we, we were out in Singapore a couple of weeks ago, and I was actually interviewing some of those people uh, for an article. You know, I'm sure this kind of approach, you can detect the, the serotype, is going to really fly. And um, so happy that we had the honor that we had the chance to, to have you on board in terms of this. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'm going to just quickly segue into the, the last um, speaker for this session before we come to the Q&A. We've heard a lot about point of care, handheld devices, and this kind of the schistoscope, the digital kind of approach. We wanted to also look at the, the way RDTs are developed for non-invasive point of care diagnostics. And in this set, in this particular talk, we're going to be looking at schistus and myasis. Um, and we've got from the Lamberton Lab at the University of Glasgow, uh, the PhD candidate working on this, Elias Cabas Pinango, who's joined us to talk of the highs and lows on the road to developing 
an RDT for the non-invasive point of care diagnostic uh, diagnosis of schisto. So I think enough from me and over to Elias. Uh, Elias, the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Cam. Can you all hear me? Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Great. And I hope you can perfect. see the Absol slides now. Absolutely perfect. Yep. You, you're on. Well, hi, everyone, and thanks for joining this session, and thanks for ISNTD for, for having me uh, today. Um, as Cam said, I'm Elias, I'm a PhD student at Dr. Poppy Lambertson's lab at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And today I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about um, the road to develop uh, an RDT for schistosomiasis and the hurdles or the challenges, uh, but also a bit of a successful story at the end. Um, and just like also some different aspects to, to consider uh, on, on the development. And because I always leave the acknowledgement part till the end and just for a change and because, uh, yeah, it's uh, good to, to start by thanking all different institutions, funders, supervisors, colleagues, and other people that are contributing to this project or have contributed to this project so far, uh, including the, the communities and, and donors who have volunteered their time and their very much needed uh, samples. So, um, to begin with, schistomyces, as you all know, is a neglected tropical waterborne parasitic disease caused by uh, traumatodes of the schistosoma genus. Uh, it's a disease, it's a debil debilitating disease that affects over 200 million people worldwide. And the WHO entity roadmap uh, goals sets the, the elimination goal as a public health problem in all 78 countries affected and elimination of uh, transmission in 25 countries by 20 uh, by 2030 um which is quite a, which is quite a, a challenge especially if we consider that there is a lack of adequate diagnostics and there is no gold standard for diagnosis for for schisto and and also it's important to take into account that an ideal point of care test should follow the assure or the reassured criteria um We've, we've heard about this uh, today already. Uh, an ideal point of care test should be should have real time connectivity, should have like ease of specimen collection, be affordable, sensitive and specific enough, be user friendly, be rapid and robust, equipment free, or at least have simple equipment if it's needed, be environmentally friendly if possible, um, and be deliverable to end users. That's an ideal point of care test, but when it comes to when it comes to real life, maybe not all of the criteria, but maybe most of it, most of, of the criteria, and it can end up being sort of a a, a a a difficult balance between what's ideal and what's feasible, and we can end up uh, not giving up, but like just maybe considering that we should follow as many as possible uh, of the of the ideal criteria and rapid the good thing is rapid diagnostic tests and lateral flow tests in this case tick most of these boxes and um during my my presentation i'm going to talk about the yeah the, the highest and and lows of my uh, of our own experience about developing a point of care test for for non-invasive diagnosis of schistomiasis. And basically, um, we are developing a lateral flow test. A lateral flow test, uh, the main key points are this, uh, this, uh, this two or three, which are easy to interpret. This would be the highs, one of the highs, but they are not that easy to develop, which would, in summary, be the lows. Um, but if the test works eventually well or well enough, you would have like some uh, highs again. So I'm going to talk briefly about um, why it's not that easy to develop or what challenges or what aspects uh, can we consider on the development of a, of a lateral flow test. Um, so in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a development of a schisto RDT, I've uh, I've considered like three different levels. 
um, to begin with the general uh, RDT development or the technical aspects of, uh, of the lateral um, immunoassay development. Also, uh, the NTD level, meaning that test, it's going to, to it's, it's uh, aimed for an neglected tropical disease. And then in our specific case, the, the, the schistosomiasis uh, level. On the first um, general or level, the technical aspects, is there a defined target? Are there specificity and sensitivity requirements? Um, is there a target pro profile before you start developing in uh, the, the, the test? Um, but also, um, is, uh, which, uh, what is the amount, what is the cost of the materials and reagents, the antibodies? Um, the, the the particles you're using for for detecting the reported particles using to 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 see the uh the re, the, re, the results is a test stable enough is it robust enough does it need equipment does it need a reader does it not uh, if it needs equipment is it is it expensive is it easy to use and do the sample need uh pre-treatment before do you need a buffer to add to the to your sample do you just not need anything and just put your sample and test and i've talked uh, i've mentioned already that but especially is it environmentally friendly and lately with uh, with covid with the lateral flow test it's uh, the amount of plastic we've we've been producing is uh, is insane and this is something that really needs to take into into account um from an entity level um do we have we considered do we know all the barriers to to access and can we tackle all of them can we make local production and uh, whether or not we can actually uh, facilitate local production uh, are there incentives or fair incentives for manufacturers uh, so that they are interested in developing new technology but also uh, knowing that the technology would actually uh, uh, impact the communities that need the, the, that, that technology. And aspects to consider finally on the schistosomiasis level is what is the use case of that diagnostic test? Which target uh, are we interested? Are we focusing on antibodies or, or the CCA or CAA antigens? Uh, which species are we aiming to detect? All of them, one of them? Um, which endemic areas, which is also linked to which endemic areas are we focusing on, uh, which sample type are we thinking of using it, and if uh, the results we are aiming to have from that diagnostic test is a qualitative and that's enough, or if we need or we would benefit from quantitative results and how do we get those quantitative results. So focusing on the technical aspects and the schisto uh, specific uh, case i'm going to talk about our experience uh, in the development of of a urine uh, lateral flow test that detects the caa antigen the caa is a circulating anodic antigen uh, there is a carbohydrate released by adult uh, feeding worms it has a unique structure which is good for specificity it's genus specific so it's it's present in all schistosoma uh, species uh, because it's an antigen, uh, this test would allow us to detect active infections only. And the CAA uh, antigen is present in both blood and urine after uh, kidney filtration. So this is a general uh, scheme uh, about a lateral flow test. And what we had fixed from, from the beginning of the project was we knew we wanted uh, the sample to be urine because it's non-invasive and because we had the, the LUMC, the Leiden University Medical Center, previous experience on detecting CAA in both blood and urine, but urine had, uh, they ha they've had, had um, very good results uh, with urine in the past, and they keep having and improving that, uh, that test. The analyte, uh, we knew from the beginning, was going to be CAA, and the antibodies produced uh, at LUMC as well, they, were, they are uh, monoclonal antibodies anti-CA. So those were... Uh, variables that we had fixed, but we need to to focus on which reported particle, which label would we use for the for the lateral flow test for the readout. So we can uh, we started having like uh, 
two main options. Is it going to be visual or is it going to be non-visual? Do we need a reader or do, can we just uh, use the naked eye for, for the readout? So we selected uh, two visual uh, particles, gold and magnetic particles, and two non-visual ones, European as a fluorescent uh, conventional uh, particle and app converting uh, phosphor or UCPs uh, based on LUMC's uh, previous uh, and current experience. Um, <clears throat> the, the, um, the procedure, uh, once those uh, prototypes were uh, developed, was the same uh, in in all of the all of the with all the particles. It was using uh, CAA negative urine, meaning uh, urine from uh, healthy donors, ideally without a recent uh, history of uh, travel to an anemic uh, area of cystomiasis. Then we would spike purified adult worm antigen. I put here purified CAA. It's actually purified uh, adult worm antigen. <clears throat> with a known concentration of CAA. Um, then we would just put a, a fixed amount of, uh, of volume. We just run the test. We wait in the beginning 15 minutes, but then we played a bit with times and volumes. And then we would see uh, the results either with the naked eye or using a reader. <clears throat> um, so the first results we got, uh, those are results from 2019, late 2019. We had a limit of detection objective of somewhere between 10 to 100 picograms per milliliter. But as you can see, unfortunately, the LOD we were getting was somewhere between 500 and 1000 picogram ml. So we were not reaching the sensitivity we were hoping for with neither of the uh, first three uh, particles or labels. Um, also, we, we tried with the, with the goal, with the first product that we, we managed to, to develop. We went to the field, just a very small pilot um, study. Um, we, we saw that uh, we were not reaching the sensitivity we needed. We then tried with magnetic particles because that would allow us to, to, to concentrate the samples without needing electrical equipment, just a magnet. But that led to aggregation, as you can see on the bottom of these strips. Um, we could we could compensate a bit that that aggregation, but but still we didn't get uh, the sensitivity we wanted. And also, you can see the strips are not really uh, clean. Let's say they're not really white after after flowing. So that doesn't help with a naked, especially with a naked eye type of readout. When we travel for us with europium. Um, we found that we probably had slightly better sensitivity, but also the, but the fluorescent readers we were using uh, were in development and the software was not very user friendly. So it was really time consuming. And again, the sensitivity was not the one we were hoping for. So we moved to uh, the app converting phosphors with the UCPs and we did get a uh, better, uh, a lower LOD, so better analytical sensitivity. And we saw that this signal was stable over time, um, which were that was great news, but maybe not great enough for the for the limited detection objective. So we reshuffle a bit the <clears throat> we reshuffle a bit the, the, the our our uh, aims or uh, and we at least for now, even though the energy sensitivity that we got with the UCPs. Uh, was uh, was higher than the other labels. We discarded it for now, at least, uh, and focus on the visual one, on the gold uh, nanoparticles as the label to use, uh, because uh, we saw it was more point of care, um, at least at this stage. And it will require no equipment. We decided to go for no um, pre-treatment of the sample, so just putting the sample on the test and wait. As I said, uh, we changed uh, a bit the, the volumes, the, the times, and uh, even though we can see it with the naked eye, we are also now trying to complement that with a quantitative uh, readout, but that's still in, in development. <clears throat> 
Um, on top of that, uh, now that we've selected, uh, we, we already had the sample, the analyte and the antibody selected, but we now have also the reported particles being gold. So this, uh, the reported particles are already, oh, those are all uh, fixed variables. Uh, but now we have all the materials. So again, as I said before, the lateral flow test is is uh, is, is probably the easiest diagnosis test to to, to interpret. Um, but that doesn't mean it's easy to 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 just change and combine things and see what happens. Um, there are a range of materials you can use. There are a range of uh, variables you can you can you can play with. Let's say. Uh, so we also made several variations in materials and reagents and amount of this uh, of these reagents as well. And the last, uh, the the latest prototype we've uh, we've developed. Um, uh, with that, we've reached uh, analytical sensitivity with spike samples of uh, between fifty to one hundred micrograms uh, per milliliter. You can see on the uh, on the graph. Well, first, sorry, uh, on the left, you can see that we are not doing any pretreatment of the sample, no buffer, uh, just adding the the urine to the test. We're using 120 microliters uh, of urine, which is really easy to 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 get from a participant, from a patient. Um, we're waiting 30 minutes, but uh, it's probably also absolutely fine to wait only for 15 to 20. But to be on the safe side, the latest, the last thing we've, uh, the last assays we've done, uh, we wait for 30 minutes, and we're doing uh, a visual G score, same as the POC CCA type of G score. We can talk about that later if someone is not familiar with that. But it's basically a semi-quantitative way of scoring uh, how intense the test line is uh, using, uh, yeah, using just printed uh, lines as a reference. Um, and what you can see on the, on the graph on the right is basically a summary of the the analytical sensitivity improvements we've been getting over time with the three main uh, prototypes. Um, the orange one being the first one, GMP1, uh, the green one being, GM, being GMP2, and the latest uh, one being GMP3. So, as I said, the limit of detection um, is somewhere between 50 and 100 per gram uh, amount. And now uh, that was when we decided it was a good time to go to try with endemic samples. That's what we did with uh, a very few uh, um, set of, uh, of samples that we had stored from 2019, which is actually the same samples that we had uh, tested with the first prototype. You can see on the, so there were, there were 20 school children, five uh, consecutive days of, uh, of urine sampling. And we, we had done cathocat microscopy with their stool samples, but also POCCCA, which is a commercial uh, lateral flow test uh, for detecting especially schistosoma mansoni uh, using urine samples as well. Uh, and the three it main iterations, the three main prototypes uh, we have. So these are uh, a total of 100 tests, but only for 20 people. So it's uh, it's it's a small um, um, sample size, but we can anyway see an improvement uh, of the positivity of the test, which is a good sign. Um, we saw uh, that these are results from April, um, and 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 we, you can see we are getting close to uh, both microscopy and poxy CA. We're still not there yet, but also we decided to move. And finally, because COVID uh, restrictions were uh, eased, we finally went to the field recently in uh, May and June this year. So we just really like, came back from from Uganda, from uh, doing some uh, evaluations of this um, of this last prototype. And uh, in this case, we we um, recruited uh, around 360 participants. Important to note, I think I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it's important to say that these are pre preliminary or even very preliminary uh, results. So 
uh, don't call me on this uh, yet, but it will be soon uh, like properly analyzed. Um, but basically, uh, out of this is again positivity of the num the total number of tests, uh, not percentage of people testing positive. We can uh, explain a bit more later. But basically, out of all the participants, we did three days of stool and urine sampling. We did catechats being three days of duplicate slides, poxy CAs uh, all the three days of uh, of, of urine uh, collection. To, to see if, the, if there is intersample variation, there is biological variation. See, there are if the if the CCA antigen varies uh, over uh, different urines in the same person, but also three technical replicates on one of the sampling days to to account for intertest uh, variation because um, to see if there is a, if there if the test if the commercial test is robust enough or not. With our prototype, uh, because of um, lim a limitation of production, basically, uh, we could only do one test per participant in total. Um, uh, over with uh, this uh, these three days of sampling, but we have stored all these samples. Uh, they are frozen, and they will be uh, retested uh, with different batches, also to, to account for inter-batch uh, variation. And also to see if there is an effect of freezing and thawing of uh, of the urine samples. So basically, um, the the catechats microscopy um, showed uh, a, a positivity of thirty seven point five percent, which uh, was with poxy CA. Uh, it was greater than that, which is expected because poxy CA is more sensitive than than catechats. And uh, our test, uh, our last prototype, uh, is getting closer and closer to the commercial one, uh, and we think that's uh, that's great news. Uh, the two different uh, um, uh, bars are based on where do you put the threshold, because it's a lateral flow test. Uh, it can be seen with the naked eye, but there's still you do depend on. Um, who, who on, on on how to interpret the tra the trace? So the trace when when there's a faint line, is it a positive? Is it not a positive? Um. So in our group, uh, uh, Dr. Jess Clark uh, established based on a mathematical model that um, G three uh, results, so meaning a faint uh, line uh, with epoxy say test would probably uh, can probably be considered a positive but we I, I still i still consider those two possibilities if you consider it positive uh, the g3 at the threshold or if you don't and then with our prototype if you consider a three three point five uh, as a positive or if you don't so if you want to become more restrictive or less restrictive on the threshold but anyway um in the development uh, of of our prototype of our test um, these are these are good news. We're getting close to uh, to the commercial uh, one. And just to finish with some take home messages um, and to wrap up, uh, developing any diagnostic test is not is not simple. And RDTs and natural flow tests are not an exception. Um, fitting the test to the diagnostic needs of a neglected tropical disease uh, and to the setting where it's uh, it's use is intended is fundamental and it's important that this is done as early as possible in the development process and finally uh, and based on our uh, schisto experience a non-invasive uh, point of care test for the detection of the caa antigen in urine could be used for the diagnosis of all types of schistomiasis hopefully in the near future so thanks a lot and any questions are welcome yeah so Thanks. So th thank you very, very much for that, Elias. Wonderful presentation and congratulations on getting close to that commercial threshold. Um, some amazing work's gone into that and I really appreciate you, you making time. I know you've been a little bit ill in the last few days, so double appreciation for, for being here. Wonderful presentation. Wonderful presentations from across the whole panel, so thank you for that. We've come to the kind of end. Um, we're running slightly over, so I just wanted to get permission from everybody. For the, we had some really good questions come through from the audience as well, which I actually want to honour and answer. I have answered if that's possible. Is everybody okay if we go on just for fifteen minutes until one? Can we all do that, or is that okay? Yeah, 
If I could ask the panelists just to come up, brilliant. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Elias, for the thumbs up. Benedict, is that okay with you? Just just until one, another 15 minutes. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's because the, the lovely, and, and Temitope uh, as well, if you're okay with that, simply because, brilliant. Thank you. Because you've got some good questions coming through, and I just want to make sure we answer those. So a lot of you have talked about, and just in that last slide there, the importance of setting the local setting. Um, certainly in um, the previous um, um, session, the local input into the design process and the R&D process is absolutely vital. And I dare say it gives a, a dotted line to the policy people if the local population are involved at some point or somehow the local voice is represented. Temitope, you mentioned that in your um, your uh, presentation as well, in terms of some questions learned uh, in that slide that you showed. There's a question from June, Dr. June Mercer Chalmers. I'm going to go straight to the, I have got loads of questions to ask you, but I'm going to go straight to the Q&A from the audience, because we've only got 15 minutes. But the question from Dr. June Mercer Chalmers, and this is to everybody, um, and then we'll dip into some uh, specific questions. Very interesting, from the University of Bath, very interesting talks. I'd be interested to hear from the speakers how they collected feedback from patients. I think we'll ask Temitope that first. You've got a field trial out in Nigeria. You, it seemed very field active, your, your work, and you really you underlined that in your slides in terms of the local input. So how did you collect this feedback? What mechanism do you use to get the feedback from patients? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Oh, yep. Okay, super. Uh, well, very, very thank you. Thank you for the question. For us, basically what we did, uh, well, we didn't deal a lot with patients. Uh, we dealt a lot with other stakeholders, starting from the university, working mm -hmm. and what we did was to do a lot of, organize a lot of co-creation sessions from from student level, from our engineers, back to the field, back and forth, we go back. And then as, as soon as, as we progress in the development, what we did was to have some very strong design questions, of course, take the device to the field, present it to the people, let them use it and give us some feedback on them. Of course, we get consent, we get the ethical approval consent form, we assemble uh, different um, user stakeholders ranging from uh, students to high-end uh, laboratory scientists, even at the national level, of course, uh, through our local partners, we could organize this and then bring them to the same room or different room at different times and administer these questionnaires and also give an open session yeah. where they can also just interact with the device, use it and give us feedback. In fact, some, some problems we think, some of the things we think were problem, were no problem to them at all. Mm. Some sensitivity we were looking at, like, oh, we want, I want to get 95, 99. These guys were satisfied with, with probably 80, provided you work in their context. And in fact, I remember I said, how much you really are embedded with the, the local context. That's a fantastic answer, I thought. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'll just spread that out. We'll go to Benedict next. So I know you're, there's a huge need for that mutation screening. You're in hospitals. How, how, how have you involved the feedback from the patient groups? Have you done that? Do you need to do that? And, and secondly, what are your, and I'm just going to widen that question, plans moving forward in terms of adoption, moving that through different hospitals? Yeah, yeah. Benedict. Yeah, so thank you. I mean, that's a great question. So um, I think there's multiple layers of sort of end users who actually deal with, with the biosensor result in some way. Um, and the first probably is the patient themselves. Now, this is quite complicated because at first glance, patients who are suspected of malaria would probably have to undergo a second finger prick. So first they get a malaria diagnosis. This is done by finger prick usually. And if they're tested positive, we would then have to do a second finger prick to find out whether we can treat them with uh, appropriate drugs. And obviously any patient is not impressed by the idea of getting two finger pricks. So this is kind of difficult and explaining the concept of treatment safety can be tricky as well. And we have shied away from this so far a little bit. Mm -hmm. The next level onwards then would be the end user. So basically the lab technician or the mm -hmm. nurse or whoever does the diagnosing in the end. We have done a study in Bangladesh where we asked exactly that question, where we deliver training to people who would be doing the testing in real life and then ask them, how do you like the device? What do you think should be improved and so on and so forth? And overall, the feedback was 
positive mm -hmm. um, with some limitations. So as already mentioned, the handling of the device currently mm -hmm. involves two pipetting steps, which can be quite complex and may that actually pay off because if you introduce two to healthcare systems that already are restrained. If you suggest an additional diagnostic, then most policy decision makers would say, look, this is really not a great idea. We've dealt fine mm -hmm. without them. Um, so there were a number of cost effectiveness studies being done. And unfortunately you would probably have to do them country specific since mm -hmm. health, the treatment delivery just varies by country. There have been some done, one in Thailand, one in Laos and one in Brazil so far. Mm -hmm. And they all showed that at the end of the day, it actually pays off if you do routine G6PD testing prior to providing treatment. Um, yeah, this is sort of a long, long, long answer to your question. Well, that is a fantastic answer, Benedict, actually. This, this, the touching upon national surveillance systems, policymakers making that argument is actually very interesting as well. We should come back to you in a bit. But thank you for that. From a patient to all the way to the policymaker, I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Um, Elias, I'm just going to quickly ask you, uh, we've seen that you've mentioned stool samples, all of this kind of stuff, how much involvement, and you mentioned local context at the end of your um, presentation, what kind of mechanisms are, are, you, are you using to involve the people of Meiji district? Yeah, so uh, it goes, the, the participants, not the technicians you mean, mm -hmm. right? They, well, yeah. Um, yeah, well, both, so actually both sets, both sets of yeah. So, so in our case, it's um, we are, I would say, lucky enough that we are going as point of care as you can go. Meaning, for the lab technicians' point of view, they are used to do RDTs for malaria. They are in the, the lab technicians we we work for. They are also used to work with the Pox CCA. Um, mm. So, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, running the assay there's no there's no barrier because they are mm -hmm. used to to do them um in terms of um well now now that we are using the g score the semi-quantitative scoring it does take a bit more of time both with epoxy CA and with our prototype it does take a bit more mm -hmm. of time than than just doing a qualitative uh yes no result um but the but yeah they yeah, they seem to be, um, yeah, like hassle, you ask for urine, no problem. Some, yeah. when you're working with the whole community, uh, some adults might be a bit less happy to provide yeah. those sort of samples, which, which of course is understandable. Um, but in general, the acceptance of providing those type of samples um, is, uh, is quite high and quite a lot of participants are, are, are yeah. And also um, what we do is, not myself because I don't speak unfortunately the local language, mm -hmm. but the the field technicians and lab technicians we work with, uh, and in in Uganda, uh, they they communicate the result individually to each of the participants. Um, yeah, because it's what you have to do, but also because there might be treatment involved depending on the diagnostic, of course. Okay. Well, th th thanks for that answer, Eli. It's fantastic. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, just moving to Alexander for a second, just coming out of this for one second. Um, obviously, your your what are your plans for moving your system forward? I mentioned this arboviral um, preparedness and resilience center that sprung up in uh, at Duke and US Medical in Singapore. Your system, I must you mentioned it, it, uh, you, you can the multiplexing, the Zika, chikungunya, there's a wider aspect to it. What are your plans with it? Where are you going to kind of nestle this system? Who are you going for? Because this is national surveillance. There is a massive gap in, in dengue diagnostics. It's needed. What, what are your plans? Who are you going to approach? You know, it's a really good question. I think um, the short answer, which kind of I want to blend with the previous answer, yeah. is that. I think you just have to keep pushing and chipping away because um, you absolutely need to get stakeholder input and there's lots of ways of doing that. One thing I found characteristic, which I think is true for other things, but dengue is probably a really good example, is that all the really expert people who really experience in dengue tend to kind of almost look at me as if to say, ah, oh, another, another person coming in to solve this grand problem. And you have to respect that because they've been in the field for a long time and they know how challenging it is. I think that the flip side of that is we also have to keep ignoring the fact that it's a complex problem and keep trying yeah. um, because I think one of the advantages you have coming into a new area is you don't have the baggage of um, years and years of experience and 
I think we should all remind ourselves what it's like to come into a field new and be young and, and free and keen. And I think that's yeah. really important. So, um, I, you know, it's it's really hard because it's very difficult. You know, like I said at the beginning, it's very difficult to solve the problem that's needed for dengue, which is to find those one in a hundred, one in a thousand people who's going to get severe disease. And it happens very suddenly. <laughs> Um, and, it, it, you know, in many ways, there are parallels with COVID. You know, COVID-19 for most people doesn't need hospital treatment. But for those that do, if they don't get hospital treatment, they'll die. So how do you pick the people? How do you pick the people to give the antivirals or the support? The, 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 the problems that are urgently pressing the clinicians are often the technically hardest to solve. Conversely, the problems we can solve with technology often don't help the clinicians. So I think we just have to keep fighting. <laughs> well, it's the age of the multidisciplinary kind of, uh, uh, approach, right? And the WHO is certainly pushing for that in their 2030 guidelines, uh, WHO uh, roadmap, NTD guidelines for elimination control. So do we need, we probably need to develop a common language somehow so that the Godzilla and Tetsuko can speak with each other, right? Two different languages in engineering this imaging for egg detection in urine. Do you think this approach has potential still? Quite thank, you. thank you, Oliver. Uh, we are still very interested in it, but we are not as active as we want to because we've spent the last uh, few months really focusing on getting this chistoscope out at least. Uh, but I will say that the approach has potentials, mm -hmm. has several potentials actually. Um, number one, you, 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 the sample preparation method can differ very greatly because sometimes you have the challenges of getting these filters egg filters in on the field these are practical challenges they have you have to import them you have to bring them in so this could be a very simple approach to dealing and then another challenge is the auto focusing mechanism right now as it is the chistoscope you have to or the automated microscope you have to auto focus you have to move samples around and this can take bulk of the time actually it takes most of the time uh, with lens lens holography, you can do this by doing a numerical reconstruction. So you don't need some of these uh, autofocusing mechanism or mechanized processes anymore. And if you get it right, absolutely. But of course, quite a challenge. So it has potential. You can simplify the sample arm. You can simplify the autofocus algorithm. You can simplify the cost. But also, you will have challenges with milky substances. We've gone to the field and we got some urine samples that were as milky as milk. You know, you don't see anything in them. And at the end of the day, your reconstruction is completely noisy. You see nothing. So the potentials are there, but the challenges are there. But okay. when you look at them and go to the field, you can get the problem solved. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, I'm aware of the time as well. We've got a couple of minutes. There's a specific question from Dr. Peter Hoekstra, who we had the pleasure of having um, Dr. Hoekstra speak at one of our sessions a year or so ago. It's on our website, it's on our YouTube channel as well. But she's asking a specific question to Elias in terms of the performance of the NG uh, CAA test compared to the, P, the point of care CAA, CCA. You showed similar percentages for both tests, mentioned that your test approaches the commercially available POC CCA test threshold. So the question is, have you also looked at the correlation between the two methods in terms of visual score? To what extent do the numbers positive, the number of positives overlap between the two tests? Quite a specific question. Elias, to you. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Yeah, yeah, and thanks, uh, Peter, for, for the question. I know she's, she's also worked quite a lot, uh, prob exactly. yeah, probably more than me, with the, with the POCSI CA um, test. So she's aware of... Um, yeah, the, the opportunities and the challenges with uh, with this test. Um, yeah, so correlation between the two methods. Uh, I haven't done that yet. We'll do that. Um, mm -hmm. What I can say is that the, the two visual scores are quite similar. Uh, what, what is called with the proxy, the G-score, um, meaning the semi-quantitative 1 to 10. Uh, it's quite similar uh, what we're using, but it's not exactly the same, meaning our four, which is our threshold, is not exact development, which eventually it probably means it might get, it might be a bit more costly to produce. But um, but but the good thing is that the lines we can see uh, are yeah are more intense than the one in the in the commercial uh, one, which I think is a is a. Um, Sure. is a good point um to what extent then so the number of positive overlap between the two tests 
Uh, again, uh, we just we, we haven't done that uh, yet. We just finished entering data. Uh, we're going to clean it it's, as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, and to match it like individually and test per test to see exactly if this positive equals a positive with both tests or not, and to see this crippled is an agreement uh, between tests. So thanks for that. And I'm just going to step back from the kind of specific questions and for a second and just and end with this kind of question, really, because we are at time. Um, funding, the F word, oh. really hates the F word, right? Who do we need to, who would you need to speak to? Who are you trying to speak to to further finance or further propel your work uh, to product and uptake and all of it? You need, need money for this. Who, who well, I'm going to go to Benedict first. You know, <laughs> put you on the spot, but who, you know, <laughs> in, a nutshell, in a nutshell, whose doors? Are yeah, well, that's tricky because I'm probably the only one around here who actually that doesn't actually develop any of these diagnostics, but it's exactly. sort of more on the evaluating side. Yeah. Um, so we usually have a fair arrangement of a give and take where I evaluate a number of diagnostics. Um, yeah, so there's there's not much funding yeah. needed, sort of, and most of the suppliers provide their products to me for free. Prototype to actually a mass-produced, widely used new diagnostic product. I'm not talking about a new lateral flow test because that's an existing technology with a new product, which is going to be cheaper. So that 50 million sounds like a lot, okay? I'd just like to say that the UK government alone has spent billions on lateral flow COVID tests. Billions. I mean, like 20 billion? So with 20, 20, 50 million is nothing. Yeah, that, that's all I'm going to say. Well, that, that's that's a fair point. There's some massive figures involved. We need to, something needs to change. We have this day every year, and financing is the issue. It doesn't seem to have changed over the last nine years. Is it going to get any better? Who knows? Elias, anything uh, to add to that? You've gone through the highs and lows of developing the RDT. Where do you go next? If you hit that commercial threshold, what are you going to do? Ask Alexander for funding, probably. There we go, Alexander. You're the man. You're the man. Yeah. No, but I'm glad. I'm glad. No, I'm. Yeah, it's, it's true that that's where flow tests are uh, uh, um, already developed uh, technology. So yeah, it's not like starting from scratch. Um, but yeah, next uh, next steps: do more field evaluations, contact, hopefully, uh, and that will probably be by the end of or. After the end of my after, after my PhD finishes, but but still contacting um, local manufacturers if possible, do some links to see if the supply chain is possible on site. If it's not, if it, yeah, see how the development can actually be sustainable uh, over time. Yeah, the local context again. I have build that case so that yeah, there's yeah, that's a great answer. Temetope, I'm going to ask you the same question. Yeah. Yeah, so I think most of the answers are all the answers yeah. actually are actually correct. That's a big challenge. I did this as my PhD work, part of my PhD work, and I have this personal commitment because I'm, I'm, I'm from the context. I mean, I, I'm, I'm from Nigeria. I see the problem real time. I've lost people to uh, all manner of uh, diseases that shouldn't kill people. So I'm personally very committed to this. And I think that. Um, the challenge also is that investors don't want to give money to this uh, because, uh, yeah, well, they come with different excuses. Who pays for it? But I think we can get donors. Uh, there are donor organizations, donor people committed to corporate social responsibilities, companies in these local places that are doing great works and making great profit. I mean, you can just commit a fraction of your profit to solving this problem. Uh, look at NGOs, uh, I mean, yeah. some of these NGO that are specific. And it's not about just giving us money. I mean, the development has gone this far. Governments have been involved. The Netherlands government has been involved. Uh, I think that also local context, the government also can be involved. Sometimes we think they don't have funds, but they do. They, they buy laptops, yeah. they buy they buy official cars for their for their staff for different applications. They can also buy uh, 500, 200, 300 of these devices yeah. and put in primary healthcare centers. If we have a good argument and we can show exactly. very clearly that there yeah. is a, a good result and it will transform a lot of things. And I think and then, but, yeah. sorry, so sorry, sorry, you you're going to add something, to me, Tope. That's a brilliant answer, actually. But the, I think you're going to just interrupt you. Apologize. Yeah, you were about to say something at the end. Ah, well, I, I think that's fine. You yeah, can go okay. ahead. I was going to say, it just underlines the local context again, because that 
the private money, the money that's in endemic regions as well, needs to be uh, sovereign wealth, needs to have an input into this. So a country ownership kind of approach to financing is definitely a step. Um, so everybody's saying great presentations, Oliver Higgins, uh, great presentations. A lot of everybody's kind of commenting on that. So well done to everybody. I hope you can join us for the next session, which starts in about seven, oh, about <laughs> eight minutes, uh, so a quarter past, uh, we're looking at molecular-based approaches for NTD diagnosis, a third session for the day, and after that will be capacity building in NTDs uh, in terms of diagnostics. So I really hope you can join us for that. I hope you enjoyed this session we have. Uh, again, thank you so much to the you know wonderful uh, presenters, presentations. Uh, June Mercer Charm was an excellent session. Thank you, so brilliant. Um, and I'm going to have to say goodbye. I'm not good at doing that, but I'm going to have to say it and press the red button. Yep. Guys, we hope you stay in touch and I'm sure we'll have further conversations.